God does not exist to satisfy the whim and wish of the believer, but the believer exists for the glory of God. That's some of the straight truth that we'll hear today from our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee on Through the Bible. I'm Steve Schwetz, your host, and I'm so glad that you're here as we continue our study of God's entire Word. Yep, that's right, all 66 books in five years. Now, if you're a new listener, we're certainly glad that you've joined our listening family that today spans the entire globe and speaks more than 250 languages around the world. So as you begin your journey, you need to know a few things. First, our studies alternate between the Old and New Testaments. We teach from every book and every chapter, and it doesn't matter where you start, just hop aboard, and in five years, you'll have traveled through the whole Bible. Not too many people can say that. Second, we provide free notes and outlines to help you get the most out of each lesson, and then you can get them in a couple of different formats as well. You can download the individual notes for each book or get them all in one digital book called Briefing the Bible when you visit ttb.org. We also have an app that has all those notes and outlines embedded. You can find that in your app store. And if you want any other way to get this stuff, you can just call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. We can put one in the mail to you or go through all these options again. And third, if you like to listen on the go, that's the way I usually listen to Through the Bible. TTB.org is also the place to check out your many different options. We've got online stuff, apps, podcasts, station listings, and many other creative devices. Now, Dr. McGee's studies are available in a format we hope that works for you. And speaking of which... Have you heard about the Bible Bus flash drive? It's loaded with every program in our five-year trip through the Bible, and it also contains the digital Briefing the Bible book that I mentioned a minute ago, plus more. So take a look at it and order one when you visit the online store at ttb.org. And then finally, one of our favorite traditions is to praise God and celebrate the work that He does in our lives by sharing listener letters like this one from Ruth in East Alton, Illinois. I've been on the Bible bus for 12 years now, and I'm on my third trip through the Bible. I've been in the church since birth and was saved at five years old, and I still remember that prayer. I thought I knew the Bible pretty well until I hopped aboard the Bible bus. I was so excited about all the new things I learned during the first five-year journey, and I continue to learn after all this time. I feel blessed that God gave us His Word to study, and I'm thankful that Dr. McGee followed his calling and shared his knowledge. Thank you for all of the continued work that you all do in taking the whole Word to the whole world. Well, thank you, Ruth. Thanks for writing to us. And then here's an email. This is from Debbie in Lakewood, Washington. The Lord is teaching me not to judge, but to listen and know his word so that I know when a deceiver is twisting the truth or when someone he has anointed to share his word is spreading truth. I learned that lesson the first time I heard Dr. McGee's voice. I judged him harshly until I listened to him speak, and then I couldn't wait to listen to him some more. He has left a legacy for us all, and his words are still as relevant today as they were when he was alive because he stayed focused on the word of God, glorifying our Lord and Savior, Jesus, with almost every breath. Well, thanks for that email, Debbie. And then our final note comes from Keith. He's in Scottsdale, Arizona. Thank you for bringing Dr. McGee's messages to all those who will listen. I first discovered you shortly after I became a Christian back in 1983. I've been listening ever since. I came from a ritualistic background and your programs helped me discover God on my own. At first, my family thought I was abandoning the church and them, especially my grandparents. But in time, they couldn't deny the change in my life because of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen to that. To him be the glory and honor for his work in me. Thank you again for the work that you do. Well, thanks so much for your email, Keith. It's agreed. To him be the glory and honor for the work that he's doing in all of our lives as we study his word. Now, what's your story? You know that we'd love to hear how God is changing and challenging you as we travel through his word together. So why don't you email us? It's super easy, biblebus at ttb.org. You can always send your note to box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. If you listen in Canada, box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. Or if you'd like to call us, you can leave a message anytime with your story. Just dial 1-800-65-BIBLE. Now, before we dive into our study today... Here are a few introductory remarks from Dr. McGee. Some of us stay at the cross. Some of us wait at the tomb, quickened and raised with Christ, yet lingering still in the gloom. Some of us bide at the Passover feast, with Pentecost all unknown, the triumphs of grace in the heavenly place that our Lord has made our own. If the Christ who died had stopped at the cross, 
His work had been incomplete. If the Christ who was buried and stayed in the tomb, he had only known defeat. But the way of the cross never stops at the cross, and the way of the tomb leads on to victorious grace in the heavenly place where the risen Lord has gone. And we are told here in Ephesians that we're blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heaven. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word that produces faith in the hearts of those who hear it. Strengthen us, Lord, as we listen and give us boldness to share your word with others. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's Dr. J. Vernon McGee with our study of Ephesians 1 on Through the Bible. Now, friends, we did not finish last time the work of the Lord Jesus Christ who paid for the church. God the Father planned the church. And God the Son paid for the church. And now we are going to see God the Holy Spirit protects the church. But now will you notice what verse 12 says? It's one of these glorious doxologies at the end of every time that Paul tells of what one person of the Godhead did, Paul stops and sings the doxology. And then he moves to the next. And here, having told us about the work of the Son... He redeemed us through his blood. He revealed the mystery of his will, and he rewards us with an inheritance. And now in verse 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ. Now, that's a very wonderful thing. The believer is for the praise of his glory. Now, God does not exist, friends, to satisfy the whim and wish of the believer. But the believer exists for the glory of God. And when the believer is in the center of the will of God, he's living a life of fullness and of satisfaction and joy. That's the place of satisfaction and joy. And when you're not in that area, there's trouble brewing for you. That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Now, that adds purpose and meaning to life, to know that your life and my life, and when you put both of them together, you and I don't have very much, do we, to offer. But we're going to be for the praise of his glory. God will be able throughout the endless ages of eternity future to point to you and me and say, look there. (laughs) You know, they weren't worth saving, but I love them and I saved them. And that's the thing that gives worth and standing and dignity and purpose and joy and glory to us. We exist today for the praise of his glory. And that is good enough. Now, this doxology, of course, looks forward to the coming of Christ. And this is the second one we've had. We'll get a third one now in a few moments. Now we come to the work of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit regenerates us. Verse 13 here. And then we're going to see the Holy Spirit seals us, and the Holy Spirit is the earnest of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit regenerates us. The Holy Spirit is a refuge for us. The Holy Spirit gives reality to life. We have regeneration, a refuge, and reality in the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, Now let's look at this. In whom ye also trusted after ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after ye believed ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Now I think this section right through here is without doubt one of the most wonderful sections. In whom ye also trusted after ye heard the word of truth. Now, what's he talking about here? Somebody says he doesn't mention regeneration. (laughs) Well, he mentions regeneration here, but the way he does it is a marvelous way because now we are passing from God's work for us, which is objective. That was the work of God in planning the church, the work of the Lord Jesus in redeeming the church and paying for it. And now the Holy Spirit protecting, it's different. You see, God's work 
for us is objective. And God's work in both the Father and the Son. And it was performed by the Father and Son. But now the work of the Holy Spirit is in us. And that's subjective. Now in this work of regeneration and renewing, the Holy Spirit causes a sinner to hear and believe in his heart. That which makes a child of God, you see. How do we become a child of God? Well, the Lord Jesus said, you must be born again. Well, how am I to be born again? To as many as received him, to them gave he the right, the exousion power, to become the sons of God, even to those that don't do any more than just believe in his name. But here it says, in whom ye also trusted, after ye heard the word of truth. Now, hearing means to hear not just the sound of words, but to hear with understanding. We have that over in 1 Corinthians. Paul says here that the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified under the Jews a stumbling block, under the Greeks foolishness, but under them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now, who are the call? Are they the ones that just heard? No, it's more than just hearing the sound of words. It means those that heard with understanding. He called them. And it's not just a call of, of hearing words, but it's a call where the Holy Spirit made real these words. And faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And it's those that were called and heard. And they heard the word of God and responded to it. And what did happen? Well, Peter put it like this, being born again, not a corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. Now, it's like this. The word of God goes out as it's going out right now. And we're saying that the Son of God died for you. And if you trust him, you'll be saved. Well, you say, I hear what that preacher is saying, but it means nothing to me. But to somebody else hearing it, and the Spirit of God is applying it to their heart, and they are believing, they're trusting. And when they trust Christ, they're being regenerated. Oh, this is marvelous. You see, believing is the logical step after hearing not necessarily the chronological, but the logical step. You believed after you heard, in whom ye also trusted after ye heard the word of truth. And that's the way you're born again, friends. This is the closest to explaining what it means to be born again that I know of any place in the word of God. You heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, the good news of your deliverance, in whom also after ye believe. And when you say after here, I'd like to change that because, again, there's always that understanding today that these are time phrases, and they're really not time phrases or clauses at all. They are what is known in the Greek as a genitive absolute, and they're the same tense as the main verb. In other words, when you heard and you believed, then at that time you were sealed. It all took place at the same time. And that's where baptism comes in. You are baptized the moment that you trust Christ. You are sealed the moment that you trust Christ. Now, sealing is the second great work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit first opens the ear to hear. Then he implants faith. And his next logical step, you see, is to seal the believer. Now, I know today there are those that argue that there's a distinction as to whether God the Father or God the Son seals with the Holy Spirit or whether the Holy Spirit himself does the sealing. And may I say to you that that type of argument today, it wearies my tiredness. I get tired of hearing that type of arguing, because after all, to try to split hairs like that 
is like they did in the Middle Ages. They used to argue how many angels could dance on the point of a needle. You toss that around for a little while, and that'll get you nowhere to argue this. I understand it to mean that the Holy Spirit is the seal, because actually, God the Father gave the Son to die on the cross. We're told that. But we're also told that God the Son offered up himself willingly. Both are true. Now, God the Father and God the Son both sent the Holy Spirit to perform a definite work. But the Holy Spirit performs the work. He regenerates the sinner, and he seals the saved, and I think he himself is the seal. Now, the sealing work of the Holy Spirit, I think, is twofold. He implants the image of God upon the heart to give reality. You know, a seal is put down on a document, and that seal has an image upon it. And I think that's exactly what he does for the believer today. I think that is the thought that we have over in John 3, 33. He that receiveth his testimony hath set his seal that God is true. God puts the imprint upon him, you see. Now, the second aspect of the sealing is to denote rightful ownership. Nevertheless, Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Now, because he makes you secure doesn't mean you can live in sin, because it means if you even name the name of Christ, you're going to depart from iniquity. And if you don't, you weren't sealed apparently, and that means you weren't regenerated. The Holy Spirit is the seal, and that guarantees that he's going to deliver us because Paul, a little later on in this epistle, will say we're sealed until the day of redemption by the Holy Spirit. One day he'll deliver us to Christ, and it's nice to be sealed like that. You can have a letter insured today. They put a seal on it. They stamp it. And they used to seal it, but today they stamp it, and when that stamp's on there, the post office said, we're going to deliver it. However, they don't always deliver mail. I'm not going to get off on that again. I have too many mail carriers and people work in post office who listen to me, and they're good people. And they think I condemn all folk because sometimes letters don't get through. But very frankly, that seal guarantees the deliverance of the letter. And all of this is for what purpose? Verse 14, the third work of the Holy Spirit, who is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. Now, earnest money is money that if you want to buy a piece of property and you want them to hold it for you, you put so much money down. That means more is to follow. Now, the Holy Spirit is the earnest money. God's given to us the Holy Spirit, and that means he's got more things he's going to give us later on. We've already seen we have an inheritance We've been blessed with all spiritual blessings, and earnest money means more is to follow. And all of this is to the praise of his glory. And here's now a third doxology that we've had here. And the interesting thing is when Paul considers the work of the triune God for us, why he has a great doxology to offer, a praise to God. And not only that, now we have the prayer of Paul. Because you see that what happens here is that not only does the Holy Spirit regenerate us, not only is the Holy Spirit our refuge, but the Holy Spirit gives reality. Now Paul is led to prayer. And so on behalf of the Ephesians, he prays. And you'll notice what he prays for. And it's very important that we remember this in prayer. He says, verse 15, and this is the prayer of Paul, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Now will you notice this? Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith and love to the saints. Now this church was noted for its faith and for its love. Love one for another. Love wasn't a motto. It wasn't a bumper sticker in the Ephesian church. It was real. The believers loved each other. And that was the church at its very highest. 
The Ephesian church in the book of Revelation, chapter 2, represents the church at its very best. That's the early church. And this is the Ephesian church. And they were noted for their faith in the Lord Jesus and for their love unto all the saints. I tell you, this was a great church. And when Paul heard that, he says, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. And you notice his prayer is a prayer of thanksgiving. Now today, the thing that motivates us in prayer for others is trouble, sickness, distress, a crisis. That causes us to pray. Now, I recently was asked to pray for a church that I love a great deal because of the things that are taking place inside of the church. No love for the brethren, nothing but gossip and Bible study no longer the top priority. And some were distressed, and they said, Dr. McGee, pray for this church. Well, I pray for it. That motivates me to pray. Now, Paul, the thing that motivated him was this type of thing also, but also something good caused him to pray. When you hear something good about some child of God, how God is blessing some preacher, some servant of God, do you get out and say, Oh, God, I thank you for this brother and the way you're using him. And when you hear about a wonderful Bible church and the word going out, do you get down and thank God for it? Friends, we turn in too many grocery lists to the Lord. We say, We want this, we want that, we want the other thing. And Lord, will you do this and will you do that? God's no messenger, boy. Why don't you thank him sometime? Have a Thanksgiving service. A preacher friend of mine told me, that their prayer meeting got so stale and dull and so small that they tried something new. And they decided one midweek service in the prayer meeting, they'd do nothing but praise God and thank Him. He said, we sure had some brief prayers, but we had a good prayer meeting that night. Nobody asked God for anything, just thanked Him for what He'd done. I think He'd appreciate all of us having thanksgiving regularly, not wait once a year, but have it more often than that. And Paul says, when he heard the good news and this wonderful thing about the Ephesian church, he says, I just cease not to give thanks for you. I just went to God and said, Lord, thank you for the Ephesian. Have you ever been to God and say, Lord, I thank you for so-and-so. He's meant so much to me. Thank you for him. <laughs> My friend, we ought to do a great deal of that and make mention. Paul says, I make mention of you in my prayers. Now, what's he going to pray for? Paul made requests, too, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Now, I won't go any farther than that today, but did you notice Paul didn't pray that they get more money, that the debt be paid off? However, I think he would pray for that. There's nothing wrong with that. But he prayed here for something that I don't know whether we pray for, for wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. Do we pray for that today? There are people that have prayed for my health, my physical health, and I thank God for them a, oh, a thousand times. It's wonderful. But I hope sometimes you'll pray Give that fellow McGee a little bit more understanding of the Word, God. He seems to be so ignorant of your Word. I wish you'd pray that prayer sometime. I'd appreciate it very, very much. Until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved. Now that's a prayer we can all pray for ourselves, and a prayer that God will always answer when we're diligent about the study of His Word. We also would love your prayers for this ministry. Pray for our fellow listeners, pray for our producers, pray for our ground staff, and then the partners that span the globe in more than 250 languages worldwide. For specific prayer points, sign up to receive the daily World Prayer Today email at ttb.org forward slash pray. Now this week we're praying our way through Western Europe, and next week we're in the Middle East. You'll be in good company as we travel the world on our knees. So again, find out more and sign up at ttb.org forward slash pray. And if you'd like to find out how you can keep the Bible bus rolling in your neighborhood and around the world by providing maybe a tank of gas or an extra set of tires, you can visit ttb.org or call one 800 
65 Bible. It's a profound blessing in my life, and I know it'll be in yours as well. Now, there's so much more to learn in this exciting study through Ephesians, so be sure to keep with us. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll be here next time, saving you a seat on the Bible bus. Today's study is always available, free to stream or download, thanks to the generous and faithful investments from your fellow Bible bus travelers. Just go to ttb.org or download our app to listen again anytime. As always, we'd love to know what's God teaching you.